thank you very much for the kind invitation to come to Dublin and uh, address you, share with you um, the short history of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Um, it's uh, for us a very um, important activity and a privilege to be able to share um, the motivation and uh, experience of this newest multilateral development bank uh, in one of our uh, founding member countries um, who uh, uh, joined the Asian Infrastructure Inve Investment Bank. Um, the, the history of the Asian Infrastructure Deve Investment Bank really starts with, um, I think, the recognition of the huge infrastructure finance needs in the world, and in particular in Asia. Um, many of you may have heard about the uh, large studies that have estimated infrastructure investment needs. Uh, the Asian Development Bank estimates $1.7 trillion of investment needs every year. Um, the, I think, McKinsey Global Institute has estimated that globally infrastructure investments should achieve uh, $6 trillion a year. Um, that's globally and includes um, high-income countries. Huge numbers. I, I don't know, I really understand what a trillion is, but it's a big number. Um, and, and the actual investments are about half of that need. Um, now, one can talk a lot about what need means, and I'll come back to that in a moment. But that's sort of the, the initial motivation for the creation of our bank. Infrastructure really is about connecting people and markets. Um, in uh, most developing countries, infrastructure really is about removing bottlenecks, um, traffic congestion, pollution, flooding. I came from Jakarta overnight, where you may have read just uh, on New Year's Eve, uh, a very large part of the city was underwater, literally, with uh, fatalities and terrible damage, um, ultimately because of lack of investment, inadequate water and sanitation, for example. So therefore, a city of 50 million people abstracts groundwater at unsustainable rates, and parts of the city sink at 25 centimeters a year. And for a city that is already mostly under sea level, you can imagine what that means. Just as an illustration for the importance of meeting investment needs uh, where there isn't enough investment. Now, then there's another story, which is infrastructure investment as a driver for economic development. If you look at China in particular, um, what comes to mind is less the filling of bottlenecks, much more the forward-looking investment, 20,000 kilometers of high-speed rail and other incredibly ambitious projects to drive economic development, which is another side of the infrastructure investment story. And, and then infrastructure investment needs are changing. They're changing um, first because, uh, because of population changes, because of urbanization. The population of cities in developing countries grows by one million people every week. One million every week. It's a number you need to... <laughs> I, I, I like that number because it's just so dramatic. Until 2050, one million people, additional population in urban uh, cities in developing countries every week. That's another Hong Kong every two months. Um, or I can give any other example. Uh, I think that, that gives you a sense of the, the dramatic investment needs for serving these populations. Climate change um, changes the infrastructure that's needed. 40% of carbon emissions come directly from the energy sector, another 20% from the transport sector. So unless um, investment profiles are changed dramatically toward a decarbonized investment. Um, uh, uh, There's, I think, just no way to, for example, achieve the Paris Agreement. Um, trade patterns are changing. Um, we can talk later about the Belt and Road as an example, but also trade disruption, trade wars mean that, uh, or economic integration in Europe. Of course, we know how much trade in Europe has changed, but ASEAN is another example in our geography where something similar is happening, where countries are coming together, forming new trade links that are very different from the historic trade links that first require new infrastructure or can be enhanced with new infrastructure. And lastly, technology. Uh, infrastructure tomorrow will look very, very different from today. And so that need for infrastructure investments is what motivated our bank. And um, now, not in a straight line, because if I didn't say it, you would say it. Um, 
there's plenty of money around. Um, there are trillions and trillions of dollars invested in zero and negative yielding assets. Um, I'm not sure whether there's room, but we get visitors from asset managers literally every week who are asking us, where can we invest? Um, so there's plenty of money to go around to invest in infrastructure. Um, and so it is not simply about just financing infrastructure. It is actually a story about matching demand and supply that don't meet. Okay. And so we have to understand why don't they meet if we want to understand why we need a new bank. Um, because simply the money is not the issue. You need to ask why does the money that is there that is looking for investment opportunities not meet the need. And then you need to unpack a, a very complex agenda that starts with macroeconomic environment in, in certain countries where you will find very little opportunities to invest because of macroeconomic instability, goes to the policy environment in certain sectors um, where if there aren't adequate tariffs, you cannot actually privately finance a project because the money cannot be generated inside the company. It goes to some projects which may be needed to meet the SDGs, but which don't have the economic or financial return that could justify private investment. Um, and it goes to the more practical issues of project preparation. Most, many of our member countries don't have the technical capacity to prepare well-designed, bankable projects, um, but need a lot of support in, in doing that. Uh, not only in terms of technical preparation, but also in financial structure, so that actually private investors could put their money into that kind of project. So it's just a number of uh, reasons why you have this huge need and you have this huge amount of capital and the two don't meet. Um, and it is traditionally the multilateral development banks, the World Bank, the ADB, the EBRD, the EIB, and others, who have played the critical role of helping countries connect these pieces. They have helped countries reform their policy environment, helped countries put in place adequate cost recovery, helped countries um, prepare projects, helped with technical assistance to implement projects, helped bring trust of private investors to put their money in those projects, helped channel resources from capital markets to those projects. And so the multilateral development banks have actually the instruments that can address the gap. Um, and so it was not that far-fetched that when China proposed to create a new multilateral development bank that it would be focused specifically on the infrastructure challenge and specifically on bridging that gap. The second reason why China proposed the creation of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank was in all likelihood the frustration that it has been very difficult to grow the activities of the existing banks because that would have been an alternative would have been to capitalize more existing institutions. Um, but that has been very difficult because those institutions have been and remain dominated by the traditional G7 countries. And for emerging countries, it's been very difficult to increase their share or to promote substantial increase in the activities of those uh, existing banks. And so the combination of the need, the ability of um, multilateral development banks to actually address a critical gap and the challenge of reforming existing institutions in their governance was the reason for China's proposal to create this new bank. So what happened since? Um, China's President Xi Jinping proposed the idea of this new bank in 2013. In 2015, China invited many countries uh, to join the creation, the negotiations for the creation of this bank, um, and many countries followed. In the end, there were 57 founding members who negotiated the Articles of Agreement, and in particular, European countries joined the AIB um, based on two premises. The first one was true multilateral governance, meaning a firm legal framework with clear rights and responsibilities of all member countries, with decision-making mechanisms that were transparent and clear, um, and that would ensure that every member country would have certain rights and that the bank could not be dominated by its largest member, in particular China. Um, secondly, um, the expectation was that this bank would follow international project standards and would not follow the suspicions that I think at that time were quite 
widespread that this bank would implement financing or would finance dirty projects or would contribute to indebtedness of countries um, or finance projects that would ca cause harm to people or the environment. And so these two aspects, multilateral governance and international project standards, were from the beginning firmly embedded in the framework for AIB. I think the third pillar that I would add is uh, uh, the commitment to sound banking, the commitment that this bank would have to be financially sustainable. Different from other development, so from some other development banks who rely on permanent inflow of taxpayers' money from, in particular, richer member countries, the idea is that AIB would become financially sustainable once it received the capital contribution from its members. So these were the three foundations, multilateral governance, international project standards, um, and sound banking. Um, the negotiations then uh, concluded and led to the creation of AIB, which opened its doors in uh, January 2016, pretty much the day four years ago. Um, the uh, found 57 founding members uh, committed subscribed capital of $100 billion, of which $20 billion would be paid in. So we are working with a paid-in capital of $20 billion and additional guarantees from our members of $80 billion. Uh, Since then, we have adopted policies and strategies. Obviously, the policies that implement the commitment to international standards on environmental and social policies, uh, transparency, disclosure, public disclosure of our operations. You can see what we're doing on our website and other instruments. Um, that's on the policy side. We've adopted strategies, for example, in the energy sector uh, to show what we can and cannot do, for example, with regard to fossil fuel financing, to implement our commitment to be a green bank, a bank that was founded um, literally or opened its doors literally weeks after the Paris Agreement came into being, and therefore has a very, I think, deep commitment to the implementation of the Paris mm -hmm. Agreement on climate change. So we have policies and strategies. Um, we have uh, put our finance, financing in, in, in place, our basic financial structure. Like other multilateral development banks, we use our capital that's contributed by our member countries, the $20 billion plus the $80 billion of guarantees, to raise funds in the capital markets. Uh, we obtained a AAA rating from the three uh, international rating agencies that allows us to capture resources in capital markets at the lowest possible cost. In May 2019, we issued our debut bond. So for, for the first time, we did issue uh, uh, bonds in the capital markets, um, two and a half billion dollars, at a spread equivalent to that of World Bank, EIB, and other top tier multilateral development financing institutions. That's critical for us because with that financing, we can then provide loans and investments to our members at the lowest possible cost. That's on the financing side. On the operational side, um, we have been blessed by a very strong support from our peer institutions, the World Bank, ADB, EBRD, EIB, IFC, uh, with whom we have co-financed from the beginning many of our operations. So I joined AIB in April 2016 from the World Bank. At that time, I was the 27th staff. Um, so we had virtually no capacity of our own at that time. Mm -hmm. um, so we started operating by co-financing with the World Bank, with the Asian Development mm -hmm. Bank and others, and acquired experience through that approach. Um, and at the same time, build up our own capacity. By now, we've invested $12 billion in some 60 projects. Last year, $4.5 billion. This year, it will be $5.5 billion. And so each year, we'll increase our financial volumes um, until... We expect in 2030, we'll probably finance something like 14, 15 billion dollars a year. Nobody knows what the world will look like in 2030, but that's what our projections uh, say we can do and we plan to do. Um, what do we do? Um, we finance large-scale infrastructure. One of our first projects was co-financed with the World Bank and other MDBs, a large gas pipeline to take gas from the Caspian Sea, Azerbaijan through Turkey, Georgia, Turkey into Europe. Um, TANAP, one of those typical $8 billion mega projects, very important for sustainable gas supply. 
Um, on the other hand, um, we finance small local infrastructure. In Indonesia, um, slum upgrading. Um, along to the government to finance small $50,000 projects to put a sewage pipe into a low-income neighborhood or to pave uh, the access road. Um, but thousands of those projects. So many, many small investments that actually make people's lives um, better, but very small scale. In addition, uh, many renewable energy projects, solar energy, one of the largest solar parks in Egypt, we finance again together with other development banks. Um, and we've increasingly financed private investment in infrastructure. The first private power plant in Myanmar, a very difficult market, was something we financed together with IFC. Um, no private investment would have come into Myanmar if it had not been for the multilateral development banks to provide the assurance mm -hmm. that the off-taker, in this case the government power company, would honor the payment obligations. That's one of the typical roles we play. So in this case, private money came in because we were part of it and could assure the investors that the bills would be paid. That's a very typical role in MDB plays. <coughs> and more recently, we have... Uh, 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 invested in some innovative structures uh, with asset managers together created bond funds for sustainable investment in infrastructure in Asia um, to bring ESG, Environment Social Governance Certification into the Asian infrastructure market. Uh, a different structure to help recycle infrastructure assets. Uh, worked with a Singaporean entity to create an entity that buys ongoing projects from commercial banks who then can reinvest the new projects and sell those banks to institutional investors like insurance companies. Um, a very important structure to address the original issue I described, the lack of demand and supply meeting, because much of the money is in institutional investors who actually don't have the appetite to invest in individual projects, but are very interested in investing in pools of diversified um, uh, and large-scale infrastructure project that we are creating through this structure. So um, by now we have 300 staff, so we've grown. We're still a small entity, but uh, uh, we've grown to 300 staff and therefore have more capability to actually work with countries on the preparation of more complex projects. Um, after four years, I think our, our um, sort of assessment is it's gone well. It's gone well because our members have upheld their commitment to the basic agreements that underpin our bank, and that's multilateral governance, multi uh, international standards, and sound banking. Those commitments are really held very deeply by our members, and I want to explicitly say including China, mm -hmm. um, because that's what allows us as staff and management to actually build in an efficient and effective bank, um, because the basic foundation really has very strong support from our members. Uh, and that is absolutely important. Um, very few, if any, decisions have been taken in a very controversial way. I think typically, like in the boards of traditional MDBs, most decisions are taken in consensus. Most decisions are supported by the vast majority of members, rather than pushed through by a small number, and in this case, China, uh, as our largest member. By the way, China holds 26% of the shares. So China is the largest shareholder, um, but cannot dominate. So that China is 26%. It is followed by India as the second largest shareholder, Russia, Germany, Korea. So a diverse set of large shareholders, but a very different set from other MDBs. Um, and of course, while well, we have now a very wide membership, which has grown from the 57 founding members to 102 members, um, the US and Japan have still so far decided to stay outside. They will always be welcome, but have so far not joined um, our bank. So in summary, we are quite happy with the success or with the building of our bank. Um, personally, if I may add that, it's been an extremely rewarding experience to take the experience I've had from the World Bank mm -hmm. in, in many years to a startup organization. Yeah. And frankly, it's a pretty unique opportunity to have a startup situation where you have the freedom of really shaping a new institution, and yet you have the 
very strong financial backing of $100 billion of capital, and you have the incredible political visibility that we've had. So it's a quite unusual, quite privileged situation we have, um, which is why I myself, but also my colleagues, have, I think, enjoyed the ride tremendously and feel quite proud of what we have achieved um, and feel very happy with the strong support by our members. And Ireland, of course, is one of our members. And uh, in that sense, I'm very happy to report here that I think the initial decisions, which I'm sure was also in Ireland not an easy one, um, I think is well justified by the developments that have occurred over the last four years. In particular, I think what we hope we will contribute is on the one hand, help address the infrastructure finance gap that I talked about in the beginning. That's our mandate, that's our focus. So we hope that as we grow, we will make an increasingly significant contribution toward narrowing that gap, bringing demand and supply for finance and infrastructure for tomorrow together, focusing very much on infrastructure for tomorrow, meaning infrastructure that is environmentally sustainable, infrastructure that uses technology, infrastructure that connects new regions uh, in the world, um, and infrastructure that tr uh, mobilizes private capital. But secondly, I do think that the creation of AIB and the relative success, if I may call it, um, I think also strengthens the overall system of multilateral institutions um, because it demonstrates that an emerging country, China, can successfully bring together a large number of countries to build an effective institution. I think that's actually quite an important contribution, especially at a time where multilateralism seems sometimes under threat. Um, I don't think it can be under threat because the global challenges are so big that there's just no doubt about the critical importance of international institutions, multilateral institu institutions. And yet, I think it's a hopeful sign that a new institution can be created, can be effective, and can be initiated by China, which has not traditionally been able to play that role. And so we hope that we can, in that way, also contribute to the robustness of really multilateral uh, cooperation and strengthen the multilateral system rather than just our own bank. So that's uh, what I want to share to kick well, us off, but I'm happy to tell you more or uh, respond to any questions or comments you may have. Thank you. Thank for you. Very comprehensive. So, so.